weeks, things moved in secret to the eastern seaboard. Rails and highways hummed with endless eastbound processions of the military. Equipment, supplies, personnel. Carload by carload, trainload by trainload. It rolled unnoticed into the east. Nobody saw much of it. Nobody knew what was happening. It was a secret. And the secret was being kept. Even while American troops poured into the waiting transports in the harbors of the east, and docks and wharves overflowed with a stream of American goods of war, across the Atlantic, British factories were also jamming up rail lines and wharves of England with British tanks and guns. Vast preparations were underway, but in secrecy. The world didn't know it. The free press of the world was shouting with increasing clamor for a second front attack against Germany, while troops were pouring from training camps all over the United States and England into the ships in the Atlantic ports. American troops, British troops, Canadian troops, Australian troops, Norwegian, Belgian, Czech, free French. The men and materiel of the United Nations gathering for attack. But the soldiers and the officers of the soldiers didn't know where or when. It was a secret. And the secret was being kept. One by one, the bulging ships had crept in darkness from the harbors into the Atlantic, with sealed orders for a rendezvous with the rest of the convoy, such and such a latitude and longitude. And then, suddenly, all together, ships, as far as the eye could carry, hundreds and hundreds of ships in convoy to an unknown destination. Freighter, transport, liner, trawler, carrier, battleship, destroyer, torpedo boat, cruiser, the greatest sea armada in naval history. Not one radio turned on. Nothing to give away the secret. It was being kept. Just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, in Washington, this vast strategy had been formulated. President Roosevelt had created the plan. Prime Minister Churchill heartily endorsed it. And together in the dark days of late 1941, the two Allied leaders discussed their strategy. To General George Marshall had gone the job of preparing the operations. And in England in April, he completed arrangements with Britain's Prime Minister. Dwight Eisenhower, now Lieutenant General, became commander of the new European theater. To General Mark Clark, the job of training U.S. troops in England. Ten untiring months after its formulation, the massive convoys nosed in silence toward their Gibraltar rendezvous. And yet, only a small handful of Allied officials knew what was coming. Scores of thousands of Allied troops en route to the attack, armed and supplied. And yet, a secret from the impatient world. The secret had been well kept. Aboard the packed transports, as troops organized in games to keep fit, they knew they were part of something big, some major action. That was obvious. There was suspense and anticipation. After several days en route began daily inspection of equipment and arms. No Saturday morning check over this. This is battle inspection. The men can sense it. And after months of training for it, they are ready. Eastward from America, moving silently to their rendezvous. Southward from England, 850 ships in synchronization more vast than any ever before attempted. Under an umbrella of protecting carrier-based aircraft, one part to the Mediterranean coast near Algiers and Oran, waiting for the moment of attack. One part remaining behind, off Casablanca, until along the whole North African coastline, the Allies can strike simultaneously. Fifteen sea miles off the key railroad city to the Moroccan interior lies the big task force of heavy U.S. naval units and packed transports. Carrier-based planes drone protectively overhead. When suddenly garrisons open fire, orders to the United States Navy were to hold fire until fired upon. But now heavy gun turrets swing slowly toward Casablanca Harbor and let loose a roaring answer to Vichy. The attack has begun.
The unfinished Jean Bart, which was to have been the mightiest ship of France, lies smoking and in ruins from the uncanny precision of the 12-inch shells of U.S. battleships 12 miles offshore. Under orders from Vichy to resist, the French forces at Casablanca fought bravely, but without heart against their former allies. Too late to prevent serious loss, came orders to surrender. The convoy lies stealthily before dawn off the wide beaches of Oran. A signal from the convoy. And from pro-ally French ashore, a pre-planned answering signal. The zero hour. In the dawn, with watchful allied anti-aircraft gunners furnishing protection for the landings, warships lying close to lay down a protecting smoke screen on the North African shore. the first waves of British and American invaders scramble down the landing nets flung over the sides of their transports. Precisely this exact moment of the early morning, at scores of carefully selected beachheads along 700 miles of the North African coast, other troops are landing in countless thousands, British and Americans together in one gigantic invasion, compared to which the German invasion of Norway was a small commando raid. Troops and supplies from hundreds of transports along the entire coastline sweep ashore. The beginning of a major offensive Allied action to drive the Axis from the Mediterranean and wrest full control of the entire area. In successive waves, the first assault troops, and then wave after wave of British and American infantrymen, signalmen, artillerymen, engineers, medics, armored forces arriving on the North African beaches and gathering their countless quantities of supplies and equipment to consolidate their landings. The Allies have arrived. The second largest harbor in Algeria, Oran is quickly occupied by the eastbound Allied forces with little or no resistance from the local French. From the White House in the United States had come a message. Mes amis, les Américains, avec l'aide des Nations Unies, font tout ce qu'il peut pour établir un avenir sain. Have faith in our words. We do not want to cause you any harm. We assure you that once the menace of Germany and Italy is removed from you, we shall quit your territory at once. I am appealing to your realism to your self-interest and national ideals. Do not obstruct, I beg of you, this great purpose. Grateful for their liberation from further vain resistance in the name of Vichy, French soldiers gladly lay down their arms and await reorganization to fight on the side of the Allies. Two hundred miles east of Oran, two hundred miles nearer Sicily and Italy, in Algiers harbor, an Allied convoy rides at anchor under barrage balloon protection. The officials have already accepted the Allies, and peacefully British Tommies and Yankee warriors swarm ashore, a scant 24 hours after the pre-planned moment of the first landings. Some of these men are seasoned British veterans of France and Norway. Most of them are clerks or mechanics, American farmers or British laborers. 
men from the cities, men from the plains of the world's two greatest democracies, allied soldiers, ready to fight their common enemy now gathering in Tunisia. Quickly they move eastward down the wide coastal highways with heavier equipment already ashore, ready to carry the attack forward. Integral part of the vast secret allied strategy to the east at El Alamein, for two weeks the British Eighth Army has been crumbling the frontal defenses of the Nazi Africa Corps. And just before the zero hour in Algeria, a fierce and endless succession of fighters, dive bombers, and heavy bombers dealt the death blow to Field Marshal Rommel's hopes of North African conquest. As relentless bombs harass the remnants of Rommel's shattered army, British artillery in unceasing fire moves the 8th Army forward in pursuit of a beaten enemy. Westward, deeper and deeper into Libya, past the wreckage of the Africa Corps and Marshal Goering's vaunted Luftwaffe. The British drive moves on without cessation, harrying Rommel's fleeing rear guard with continuous assault by air and land. Supplies and equipment and reinforcements for frontline troops move constantly forward to keep lines of supply intact in the wake of the furious and unceasing British drive under the command of Britain's brilliant General Bernard Montgomery. In the desert, panic-stricken Italian prisoners by the thousands, deserted by their Axis ally, gratefully accept British protection, throwing down their guns and giving themselves up willingly. Back in Algeria, the mopping up of Germans in the captured cities is quick and thorough. Armed with secret lists, Allied agents in Algiers quickly round up the German Armistice Commission, caught red-handed by the invaders, while elsewhere in the city, frightened Italian and German visitors, the Axis-famed fifth column, are rounded up for permanent internment. There they go, and with them, all Axis hopes of conquest of North Africa. No longer is the native population frightened to show its hatred of the Axis, or to wildly cheer their American protectors as they arrive. As U.S. forces pause behind the eastward moving front to decorate the heroes of the landing, general and doughboy alike are soberly aware that this can be no more than the beginning. Now, for the first time since the war began, there is real opportunity for U.S. fighting men to mix in battle with the Nazi, to drive him out of Africa. From bases in England, from bases in Egypt and Libya, from bases in Iran and Algiers, U.S. liberators and flying fortresses, British Lancasters, Sterlings, Halifaxes, pouring two-ton blockbusters down on an Italy already chafing under German domination. will be no let up. There will be no relief. These bombings will get only worse and worse until the Allies have won.